Jeff had set the text. Um, and um, well, if you want, I can just say, I mean, I read it. Um, and Tom, you sent me another text, but I, I just didn't get a chance to read that one, but I will on a similar subject. Um, but I read uh, the one that Seth had suggested, and it's very short. And it's just to sets out the problems of neoliberalism in terms of financialization, austerity. And then it, the second half of it sets a few examples of how architecture can oppose this. And uh, the examples that I remember were a project where Lacatin and Vassal decided not to build in a, in a, in a square. Uh, another example where in Manchester, I think in Manchester, there was a proposal, a counter proposal to a developer's proposal for a large Royal, Royal Mail site. Now go on, the, the, you, if you read it, you'd remember some other ones. I, that's, those are the ones I can remember. Yeah, I, some other group um, did some work, but then they, I think they sort of, they did the work and then disowned it or so. I can't remember exactly what their act of protest was. They sort of wrote a letter saying, we're doing it, but sort of under protest kind of thing. And which were Sorry. they? I can't remember which one they were, uh, Mark. I, I read this last uh, read it last Monday night or last Tuesday, so uh, I can't remember yeah. exactly. But uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think I agree. I think it was sort of, uh, it was quite a straight down the line text, you know, sort of uh, your, uh, you know, uh, this is what happens with neoliberalism text. Uh, I thought, uh, I had some thoughts about it. Uh, I thought that, uh, I mean, I, I sort of, I, I guess really, I mean, I, uh, I agree with this, this writer, you know, I, I, I sort of uh, uh, I sympathize with his position where he's coming from. I share his point of view in many regards. I think though, uh, perhaps things, it, it did remind me a little bit maybe of where we were perhaps in the late 1990s or early 2000s. I think we, things moved on a little bit since then. Um, I'm not sure that the straight neoliberal narrative really applies to what's been happening, say, in the profession for the past maybe five or ten years. Uh, and I also think my other take on it as well is, is that I think this particular take that the young writer was, was, has is something that's quite specific maybe to Britain and Ireland. I'm not sure if it applies in the other, you know, across, say, for example, Western Europe. And I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't apply in the United States because I lived there for a while. You know, I worked there for quite a long time. And although it does have its own sort of neoliberal issues, uh, they're not the same ones. Okay. It seems. Me um, uh, so I, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I guess the, the f on the first part, I would say uh, my take on it is that sometime after uh, Tony Blair and maybe. Um, you know, maybe, and, and perhaps, well, Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, this sort of third way, uh, the third way labor position developed, which has led to sort of, I, I, in my view anyway, to the public-private partnership approach, the PPP approach to procurement, which I don't think is quite the same as the neoliberal position that, that I think this, that the writer is talking about, which is really, I think, strictly applies to the de development of um, somewhere like Canary Wharf directly, you know, as a result of, uh, of, of the Thatcher government, which was a very particular kind of a thing. I think we've moved on. And I think what's happening now is that people are beginning to realize that in the PPP system, we also have problems, but they're not the same problems. You know, it was an attempt to, to repair or to somehow, you know, sort of, um, take account of the giant flaws that have been, been identified. Uh, after, say, something like Canary Wharf, but it's led to another whole other set of problems, which are subtler or harder to get your head around. And then also, I think the, uh, and then the second point of relation to, I think it's this particular approach, this sort of, um, the, the, this precise type of neoliberalism, I think is very much to do with the fact that in Britain and Ireland, because of the way the planning system works, speculation on land is very, very easy. But in most of the parts of the world, speculation, including the United States, land speculation is actually quite hard. Now, not all the states are the same. 
some states are different than others, but typically they're sort of moving toward a position where it's becoming harder to speculate on land. And certainly when I was living in New York, you couldn't read you know, the way the, 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 uh, the planning system works. You can't actually really speculate on land. Uh, what you can do is, is you can buy a piece of land and you can buy a piece of land and we both know exactly what it is that we can do and we can build 10 stories. So we know exactly what the return, you know, what exactly the game, you know, we know the rules of the game. So in order for you to make more money than me, you have to make a better product, really. Uh, you have to be convinced that you can sell each apartment for 100,000 more than I can. Mm. So that, uh, I mean, I've always been quite struck. Um, and when I lived in America, I didn't actually, I wasn't that familiar with uh, the planning system in Ireland. And I've always been quite struck by the fact that Irish developers, when they go abroad, you know, when they go to the States, for example, realize that they can't mint it. So they come back, they don't stay. And uh, American developers look at the Irish system and don't like it. You know, they tend not to get involved. Hmm. Uh, they sort of see it a little bit as a free for all, which I think it is. I mean, it strikes me as the most, uh, the system in Britain and Ireland is the most spurious of all that I've come across anyway, you know? I mean, it's, it's miles away from what you have in Holland and very far away from what you have in, in uh, the big cities in North America. Wow. Never knew any of that. That's really interesting. Yeah, it is. It is. It's actually interesting, Mark. Yeah. I, so, I definitely think it's something that we should be talking about. So what, you know. what again just what is the difference in north america the there are greater there's greater taxes greater restrictions on speculation and speculation is that the no greater regulation uh, not really no it, it it varies from state to state and from city to city uh but typically they're moving towards uh, northeastern cities would have been the most uh, say, um, restrictive uh, so California and Texas and various other states are moving into a kind of a, a New York position. So in the New York situation, what they've got is in 1963, they adopted what they called the zoning resolution. Mm -hmm. And in the zoning resolution, it pretty much maps out for all five boroughs of the city exactly what you can build on every single site that exists. So it tells you precisely uh, in this part of town, you can build a 2000 square foot house uh, that's set uh, 15 feet back from the street and is um, 10 feet from its neighbours and has the maximum of two storeys. So in one part of town, you can do that. Mm. In Midtown Manhattan, it says you can build 100 storeys. The first two floors have to be uh, retail. The next 50 have to be uh, office and the next 20 have to be residential, let's say. Mm. So uh, each and every single site is completely mapped out. And in order then, if the city decides that what it's going to do, uh, which it, it can't really anymore, but where it decides that it's going to expand its, its uh, border and take a piece of land that's now, let's say, in the equivalent of County Kildare, uh, in order for it to do that, we would have to come up with uh, a, a, a new zoning resolution, which says, okay, these are the plans for how this new part of the city is going to work. And it's going to be precise to that place. Gary, uh, Gary, your somehow or other your volume's gone right down. I just couldn't hear. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, I don't know what it is at all. <laughs> uh, but uh, so if they were to bring a, a new part of the city into, you know, if they were to expand their borders, uh, they'd have to come up with a system pretty much of uh, streets and cross streets, plots, and um, decisions about what exactly could be built size wise. Mm. Uh, volume wise uh, on this new site yeah now, what it effectively means is that if you're the developer and you decide to build it uh, it means that you just like every other developer in town knows that 10 stories is going on that site nothing more nothing less that what that's what's happening and so there is no competition over who can get the squeeze the most development uh, on the site. Yeah. so uh, whereas in ireland for example uh, I mean, I don't need to tell, you know, it's well rehearsed. You know, we have the situation like Balls Bridge where somebody thinks, well, I can get 10 stories out of it and somebody else says, well, I can get 20 stories, I can get 30 stories. Next thing we're paying a half billion for a site uh, based on a massive speculation. Mm -hmm. And of course, this happens all over the country. And so we're in it, we're, like in Ireland, it, I, it took me a really long time to get my head around this when I came back, that um, 
the way in which land can be speculated upon in this country is absolutely staggering, really staggering. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're, we're so used to it, you know. But when you come into when you come to Ireland from other other places, I mean, it's just it's absolutely mind blowing. You just sort of think this is just like the Wild West. I remember, Tom, you were when talking about co-housing, you mentioned how the planning system in Germany, it's so much more predictable that it allows yeah. for, more, <clears throat> for people to make a kind of predictions in, ways, in a way that they couldn't hear. Yeah, but I think the financialization of the market is probably worse here, even if that's possible, than it is in Dublin. Um, like in, well, first of all, it's true. It, it sounds quite similar to what, you, what you're uh, describing, Gary, in terms of the surety of, of what you can do on a, on a particular site. But as against that, you've got, um, like Berlin has been at the center of international finance, financial um, speculation oh. for, for about, well, since the wall came down really. Mm. So you've got um, all of the um, apartment buildings that were owned or that were uh, owned by the state essentially um, in the DDR in the, in the East. Um, were open to privatization after the wall came down. So, uh, and, and the same um, process then affected uh, state owned or, or housing association owned apartments in, in the West. Um, so you, you have like multiple thousands of apartment buildings being owned by single entities mm. now. So like BlackRock uh, will own, I think it's something like 20 or 30,000 apartments in Berlin. So it's just on a staggering scale. Uh, so as a way of working against that, um, there's been a citizens initiative recently to um, organize a referendum to renationalize uh, all of these apartments at a kind of a nominal sum or maybe at a cost wow. uh, to try and re redress the balance. Um, then a similar, well, a sort of a parallel phenomenon then is gentrification. Um, okay. Gentrification has been happening in areas like Prince Lauerberg um, for, for a couple of decades now, so that uh, at this stage, you've got a completely uniform sort of uh, demographic in a whole, whole area. You know, it's just the same kind of people um, living, living in one large ge geographic area. Mm -hmm. So it's completely sort of unbalanced the city and made uh, kind of living in the city uh, unaffordable for most, for most people. Um, and I guess in, in Dublin, just the other kind of aspect of financialization is, is uh, uh, international finance investing in, in the private rental sector. Um, so that's oh, it, again, the rental sector, is that what you said? It's the private rental sector. Yeah. So it, like in Dublin, you've got rents rising at about on average about 6% every year. Um, and, uh, so private residential rental, um, property has become very attractive to international investment. So it's kind of gone up to, to again, to a kind of a staggering scale in the last few years, um, where the average investment, I think now is about 75 million. Um, so, so funds are buying kind of multiple projects in Dublin uh, or in Ireland, I guess, generally. Um, so it's kind of, I suppose there's local differences, uh, but I think it's fairly safe to say that the same, it's the same phenomenon internationally, really at this stage. Every, every European city, every European city is at, uh, at risk or, or is currently being um, subjected to speculative investment. Um, Has anyone here seen the film Push a few years ago? Um, no. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, do you? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, UN rapporteur on housing. On housing yeah. And what comes across is two things. One is the internationalization, the international nature of the problem. Uh, and the other thing that comes across is the counter movement led somewhat by the mayor of Barcelona to intervene um, on against, to make interventions against the market by purchasing up, by buying up properties. Um, uh, uh, there is a reference in the text to a GLC initiative 
uh, from mm. from from the Red Ken days. Yeah. Um, stand up for a New Deal youth demo in London March. I'm not sure if that if it amounted to anything more than a demo, or I, I can't remember. There's a there's a graphic. Um, I was yeah, going to ask Kate and Dara to turn on your phone, your pictures, just just because there's not that many of us here. If you want to. In terms of Barcelona, Barcelona are partnering with the, with a number of European cities now to yeah. work, work back, um, including Berlin. And Berlin's land management policy has completely changed in the last few years as well as have, have other cities here in Germany. So uh, the city will, or the state will no longer sell land to the highest bidder anymore. Okay. Uh, it will only lease land. Uh, and that's a way of trying to control and development. Uh, and make development affordable, uh, but control it long term, the, 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 the city owned land. So uh, it's kind of no longer um, being sold to the, to the highest bidder or to, to international speculators. So has that, um, ha have these movements against the, the free movement of capital into property in cities, have they, are they gaining significant um, force at this point? Is this becoming how widespread is this? Um, I mean, the film, the impression I got from the film was that it was just at its very earliest stages. That um, I, I, Have you been doing research over the last year, Tom? Have you more, uh, yeah. is you more hopeful? Yeah, I think I'd be more hopeful, yeah, because I think um, like the, the European Parliament is kind of getting a little bit more organized even on, on this issue, but like specific cities, especially, like Barcelona has been really suffering since the since the crash uh, I mean ba basically you've got and this, the same is true in Dublin right you've got lots of non-performing loans now from from the crash it's a kind of a hangover so all of our banking systems are, are kind of crippled by having all of this debt and and the the European Commission is trying to kind of make the sector much more uh, kind of stable going forwards so it's trying, it's trying to encourage all of the banks to get rid of this bad debt or potential bad debt. And who, who's coming in and buying the, this debt? It's, it's international finance. They're, they're buying it at a, at a discounted rate. So like in Barcelona, you, you'd have funds coming in buying your apartment if you can't, if you can't afford to uh, repay your loans. Uh, they're, they're renovating the apartment and putting it back on the market, on the rental market at four or five times what, what you, you've been paying. Um, so uh, it's just becoming kind of impossible for cities to, to carry on like this. Um, mm. so, so they're trying to take, take back control. Um, so we, we've been looking specifically at, at uh, Germany, uh, Belgium, the UK and, and uh, Switzerland, I think. Uh, and just looking at, at land management policy um, there. And like that's not, not selling land anymore is, is probably the most uh, successful strategy, but uh, cities here will have like a minimum allocation policy for uh, social and also for uh, community led housing strategy. So about 50%, 60% um, of all development has to be um, either social or, or, um, or this kind of affordable housing. So like there's, an, there's an, a, a number of different strategies um, that's, that cities are, are being forced to deploy. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, it would be, it'd be like fascinating if, if that referendum come in, came into being in, in, in Berlin and all of these um, thousands of apartments were Taken, taken away from these international funds and uh, mm. back to people. So like, I suppose, th th this, like just to get back to the text, I mean, to me, it seems like there's this kind of process on, on, on the international level, on the highest level, this kind of international finance mm. stuff. And then, and then there's practice, which is at the ground level. And, um, and, and, and that's, that's the only way that, that anyone has of, of addressing these these kind of issues is is to work at the ground level, um, and one thing that's quite successful here is is local initiatives to uh, 
to do things, you know, to, to build, build a, a project on a, on a specific site or to arrange a referendum to change policy. Um, so for me, that, that, that uh, practice can be quite, quite effective. And then, and then there's also architectural practice itself and just kind of trying to rethink what that can be, whether we're talking about architectural practice being only about design in terms of designing kind of fabric or whether architectural practice is about designing processes or designing um, working with communities or working with people to think about how they can finance projects or to, uh, to organize themselves. Um, and kind of including all of those activities within within the range of design. You know, rather than saying, you know, I'm only ever going to work with this kind of project or, uh, you know. Or to be more proactive about uh, setting the brief rather than just waiting for jobs. Yeah, it's an aspect of practice, really. So it's, 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 it's a kind of how you practice is, is about engagement, right? So uh, ultimately. Um, so how, how do you, how can you engage effectively and um, kind of make, make change? I think that, that's, that's where thinking about practice becomes much more interesting than just thinking about it as a, a, a purely formal sort of problem, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think Tom, um, that, uh, yeah, I, I think the problem for, problem for me is that, um, like in Britain and in, in Ireland anyway, that if your intonation is to work a particular way or to look at processes or to see if there's a way that we can bring about change, that because of the way that land is speculated upon here, because of the returns being so, they can be so enormous for so many people, that um, the, the amount of impact that you can have is really, it's very, very small. And it doesn't really lead to any change. You know, just it's never the, the, the planning system hasn't changed. The big opportunity was in 2000 with the planning act. And even at the time, I remember being on sort of um, panel. Sheila de Valera was the minister for heritage. Although I can't, I, I was on panels, you know, advising that we should do this, we should do that. And people spent a lot of time talking about this problem of speculation. But at the end of the day, the planning act changed nothing. And I think maybe it is possible in cities like perhaps Amsterdam, I'm slightly familiar with how they, they procure things, you know, they, they, at least on greenfield sites or brownfield sites, how they start off, you know, it's not in the aftermarket, they, they can be a little bit different, but at least how they start off, they try to, they have a very plausible and kind of very fair-minded system. But I mean, I think in a country, like in a place like Dublin, where the odds are just so stacked, so stacked, that it almost seems, you know, it's just, I, you know, it's sort of my, it's kind of, it's sort of maybe, it's kind of like, um, you know, just putting on a plaster or maybe taking a position or a pose, but that's all you can possibly hope for. And I find it just terribly frustrating, you know. In fact, I have no interest really in, in practicing as an architect in Ireland, you know. I just don't see just don't see the point, you know, I just don't see the point. Yeah, I can completely understand that position. And I think we're, we're kind of invested in, in this approach on a number of levels, on a kind of personal level, like people feel that they have to have own property to, to have long-term security and to old age. And um, on a kind of a governmental or policy level, we're kind of wedded to this, as you kind of mentioned, this public-private approach uh, where um, like o o only a certain type of development is, is kind of understood as being being viable but like public private is also it's also possible that, that you could have a public private approach between uh, civic bodies and uh, community groups or community housing groups com community led uh, kind of development that's all that's all kind of comes in under public private as well what we're trying to engender is, is kind of a uh, an approach, a sort of civic partnership approach uh, to to development or to uh, to housing. Um, that's much more, yeah, community oriented or community led. 
That said, um, Gary and others, by the way, uh, please contribute um, others. Um, you obviously, uh, but Tom is working at the center of a group called Self-Organized Ar Architecture, looking into alternative forms of housing provision um, based in Germany and in, in Ireland and other places. Um, I was involved at the beginning, but I kind of moved away to doing work for socialist party campaigns, which was another another aspect of this is um, campaigning to have not to have public sites um, fobbed off to, you know, flipped over to developers, which is a, a yeah. terrible practice. And we had we had two campaigns that I've involved in, which relatively successful and just the really kind of campaigning and what I was involved in was just pr producing alternative proposals a bit like the thing in the article that we saw here um, and but the main the main alternative was that the that the, that the city and the local authority would maintain would hold on to the sites and build social housing on them rather than uh, hand them over the drive the PPP drive and the neoliberal drive has its roots in the international order of finance so that this country, for instance, has to be running on nothing. It's like a business. It has to reduce its costs in order to increase its credit rating, in order to be, you know, a, a, to abide by the, the, the rules of the EU and the Troika and the ECB and so forth. And just the rules of international capital. Um, st states are not meant to, you know, it's embedded in EU philosophy that states are not meant to interfere in the market. This, this is a terrible, terrible, deep sickness of classical economics, for want of a better, free and mild. Mark, I, I came across a project really going back a few years. I was doing a little bit of research in this area, uh, just to, to satisfy my own curiosity. I was looking at a project that was happening somewhere on the outskirts of Amsterdam. And it's, uh, if I understood it correctly, the city had decided that it needed to Ex, you know, expand into an area. So they bought the city or the community bought the land from, the, let's say, the farmer. Mm. But they bought it at the, at the uh, agricultural rate plus seven uh, percent. They developed their plan. The city developed the plan the way they wanted it to. You know, the, this, the way this new area is to develop. And then the city put the put the put the um, project out for tender. So the developers could tender on the project, but that's all, Not they could speculate on the land. Um, and then, uh, I, I, as, as I remember correctly then, if the project was a great success and they made more money than they expected, they went back to the original landowners and gave them some kind of a bonus. And uh, it's, I just thought it's, I mean, it's not ideal, and you big holes in it. And I know it doesn't cover the aftermarket situation, which is always a problem in big cities. You know, what happens 10 years down the line, you know, when uh, people default on their loans and the vulture funds come in. And at least as a way of starting, I think it's uh, something, it's so far away from where we are in Ireland, you know, where if you've got a piece of land to put there at the minute and you're a farmer, you're just going to sit there and sit there and sit there until somebody offers you 100 million. Mm. And I just, I can't understand, you know, we can't run a country that way. And we can't house ourselves that way. We can't house people that way. You know, it's just shocking. It sort of, it goes against every, it's like, it's just, it's like the most inhuman form of behavior you can possibly imagine. And we're, and we're doing it. Just a, a little detail, it's not a little detail, but I read once that a lot of this goes back to the, something called the Town and Country Act. Forgive me for mm. I'm wrong. Uh, before independence, uh, in which more or less the adversarial structure of the legal system, which we have, uh, which we acquired, is kind of transplanted into planning. So that adversarial system is more or less a, a fight. I mean, Tom, you, you can tell us more about this, but it's more or less a competition between between people for maximizing their their um, whatever their their ends rather than planning led, rather than um, led by analysis and, and, and proper planning. There's um, obviously we have a planning system. The, the current uh, joke, um, my, Frank McDonald, it's Alan Mee's joke is the planning industrial complex, which I think is great, um, which is what we, have, what we have in this country is. Um, and uh, that kind of whole, whole professional cohort of people um, designed to maximize value 
because that's what the system does. The system is an opportunity to maximize value. But the problem, of course, is that our pensions and our, so many of our structures of financing are in, embedded in it now. For instance, if the referendum passed in Germany that you mentioned, Tom, that um, there would be serious attempts at the EU level to, to go against the, anything like that because of the damage it would do to the investment, the perceived damage to the financial world. Yeah, but I, I think there's a kind of a growing feeling that things have gone as kind of as far as they can go. Um, and like this, this problem with the, pl with the planning, um, that system of speculating on, on land, people sitting on land, I think that's going to have to sort of change. I mean, it seems to me that there's um, something about um, like the idea of the good or a consensus about um, the idea of how, how we want to live is, is not really that, that clear or, or it's, it's not really possible to do that on a national sort of um, level. Um, so like it's, it's such a fragmented kind of um, landscape then, but um, like there, there are definite steps that, that you can take against this kind of speculation. You know, you can just tax the gain, like you can just tax the, um, put 100% tax on, on relative <coughs> uplift in property prices, all, all of that stuff uh, you can do. Um, if, you've, if, you, if you've got the, the mandate to do it, you know, so as, uh, as you've kind of alluded to, that mandate, that mandate is very confused and, and we've, there are kind of different interest groups kind of driving different sort of uh, policies are stopping things changing. So, um, but the, it, seems, it seems like in Ireland, well, there is, you know better than I do, but um, the debate is kind of a little bit fragmented. What, what's a good city, you know? Or how, do we, how do we want to live in, in a place like Dublin or Cork mm. or in, in, in Offaly? And how, how, how do we want to kind of manage this, these, these processes? But is, is that, is, is that, does that come within the, the realm of practice then, of architectural practice, or is that something else? I think, yeah, I think what the article, I've started to come around to this belief that the article is promoting is we're all political. You know, so we're all political and, and as architects, therefore we're political, even just because we're people and we have a choice about how to, what to do. Um, so a student just sent me uh, the Architects' Union now Architects students are forming a branch of Architects Union. Um, Architects Union to protest against low wages for for graduates. Um, yes, that's really important. And I've been involved in looking at crits at crits because that's really important because a lot of the conditions are set down in education. The power relations are are laid down during education, where people are are actually inculcated into a power structure. Which and it's it's only to take this approach that you're taking, Tom. You, you have to be you have to kind of step out of that and go. No, I'm actually going to start determining the conditions. I'm not just going to sit here and receive instructions about what I'm what it is I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, I mean, for for me, um, at least from my experience uh, in education, architecture has always been really about about just this kind of limited idea of design. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's always been kind of implicitly understood that there's a social function there, but that's never been really, um, really explored. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that's something that's quite interesting in practice here that, that you've, or it's more common maybe in the UK or, or here in Germany, this, this sort of um, in, in involvement in, um, in other approaches are, Trying to think about design as 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 more you know designing make, making projects financially viable uh work, working out how, the, how that how you can do that um or um working out different routes to development and and all of these come within your remit as designer or you know working working with these processes so the design process is, is kind of expanded a little bit more out from just thinking about 
about formal questions or technical questions. Yeah, yeah, Tom. I I think part uh, part of the problem in Ireland is that um, there's there is no like I mean there is no I mean the architects might discuss this amongst themselves quite a bit and they do of course, but there is no um, general conversation about. Uh, the nature of planning, how should we, you know, how should we plan for the future, how should we plan our cities. There is no public discourse. Um, for example, like I pay, I spend a lot of time maybe listening to French radio, French or watching French TV. I spend a bit of time in France. You know, these things get, you know, they get discussed, you know, they get discussed on TV. Um, like back in the day, uh, we don't really have an equivalent now, but back in the day, Jacques Derrida used to show up on TV Claude Levi Strauss would show up on TV and he'd have things to say and people took it seriously. In Ireland, we're operating at the level of the Joe Duffy show. And so, um, you know, the four, we don't, you know, our, our public service broadcasting, I, I mean, I, I haven't heard a single interesting debate on public service broadcasting um, ever. Uh, and for as long as that happens, I mean, it's very, very difficult to make any kind of progress because people who might otherwise have an interest in what it is you have to say, they're not even aware of the issue. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I find like even, even in the States where, you know, uh, you know, obviously there'd be all sorts of reasons to frown on the way things get done. I mean, even in a city like Los Angeles, it's horrible uh, and has the most shameful homeless situation. That, I mean, if people only realized what was going on there at Skid Row, if people only knew, it's just astonishing, you know, street after street after street of homes of people living in essentially uh, an independent republic of chaos, but not even I mean, just a, a place of lawlessness um, or all sorts of horrors happen. Even there, Frances Anderton has a, a podcast or a, she's on a, a, a public radio over there. Even there, they're discussing it so that at least you take, you can have a position, you can decide, and I'm going to be utterly Calvinist about it and leave these people out on the street. But at least it, at least it's happening within the context of some sort of public debate. Uh, here, there's just no discussion whatsoever about anything. None, like none about any aspect of the built environment, you know, beyond, beyond sort of like the kind of populist things that people would talk about, you know, global warming is bad and litter is bad. Like the really serious discussion about what needs to be done just doesn't, there's no venue for it whatsoever, none, you know? Yeah. And that's, think, that's a real problem. Yeah, I mean, the, the discourse on housing, especially is, is, is particularly poor, I think. Um, like it, 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 it's really only talking about units or num numbers of units and um, kind of delivery of, of housing, which, I mean, the situation is, 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 is urgent so I can I can kind of understand it to, to an extent but um, actually how we how we live how we live with that you know um, beyond just just pure like numbers what, what are we talking about and um, what about all of these other issues like like aging like like loneliness or you know all, all of sustainability uh, or urban situations uh diversity um how, how 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 what role do they have to play in all of this um that the disc the discourse is sort of one-dimensional i think and uh t like time and again when i hear uh like especially the minister for housing uh talking about uh about housing um he's he's really only ever talking about numbers you know um mm. Um, so Kate, is that Kate who was in Dublin, in Bolton Street by any chance? Don't want to pick on you. You were here. Were you here last week? And the reason I'm asking you is if you can hear if you would talk about the way the new form of reviews that you're doing in Bolton Street. The reason I, I'm asking for it is because um, I do have some hope that maybe what happens in the schools uh, might be where this thing starts to change. If architects are going to become more political and start um, setting the agenda, then they can't just continue to be trying to do all the drawings they've been asked to do for their final review and uh, you know be part of that production. Um, but anyway, maybe Kate 
wasn't Bolton Street, and maybe you can't hear us. If you can, I'd like to talk about it. Um, I, I guess that's what I'm just focusing on because Jeremy Till is quoted in the article, and my Hugh was actually given out about him a few weeks ago here, but uh, and I know he's not there because he just started the meeting. So, uh, but the he's one who's made that link between education and practice and responsibility, the responsibility of the architect to the community and to the, to the user, himself and Rosie Parnell and people like that. Um, at the same time as they were looking at how education was, was being done, they're looking at um, the responsibility of the architect. They can see that. They can see that the, the architect, the lack of politi political responsibility of the architect has its origins in the schooling system, in the education system. Another great origin in Ireland has to be the land acts. These are really huge. And the policies of, of successive governments to, to facilitate home ownership, that home ownership becomes the, own, the solution to all problems. Um, that there's no concept of uh, other forms of, there's no, there's no concept of, there's, no, there's, a, there's a fundamental lack of credibility to publicly owned rental accommodation. Mm -hmm. I think it's a. I think it's a, it's a. It's a problem about about how you um, get security in, in in your life. You know, um, if if you're renting, the reality is that you're probably not going to be able to save, uh, because it's actually cheaper to buy uh, if you can if you can get a mortgage. Uh, then it's it's much cheaper to actually buy something, and then you've got once you retire, then you've got a. An asset. So, um, like, I think the it's projected that most people will have an income of about twenty thousand euro uh, once they retire uh, per year. So, if you're paying like twelve thousand on on rent, you're not going to have very much to live on. Mind you, Tom, I hear again and again from personal anecdote. Now, I'm sure you're hearing it. People retired who can't afford to pay their mortgage, and yeah. who who are losing their Okay, sorry, there, there, Kate, sorry. Um, with my mom, oh, okay, sorry, Kate, that's fair enough. Sorry, to, sorry for picking on you there. Um, but yeah, um, so, you know, I'm thinking more that the idea of state owned rental accommodation, which is capped, you know, which is a percentage of people's income, um, which we do have a good solid collection of in this country, um, which Thatcher destroyed more or less. They, they haven't succeeded in destroying it in this country, but that that would be considered to be a legitimate part of the housing provision and that that would be a, you know, an acceptable part of everyone's idea of what would be, okay, what would be um, a legitimate, as I say. A, 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 in other words, a private ownership isn't, isn't the be all and the end all. Yeah, I think the cost rental thing is going to change things a little bit. That's, that's going to be quite significant what was being built there. Whether that's actually affordable remains to be seen, but um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's or whether people want that, you know, um, remains to be seen, but it, like on the face of it, it looks like a fairly attractive kind of offer for, for people, I think. Well, tell us more about the cost rental. I've been- um... well, The idea with cost rental, they're, they're trying to copy what's been done in, in Vienna um, with this with this model, cost rental is basically the idea that you develop a project and then people pay rent to cover <clears throat> the development costs only. Mm. So um, not not um, you know they don't you're not paying the market sort of rate if you like. Um, the, there's a, there's a there's a sort of a, uh, a pilot scheme being built in step aside at the moment by the housing agency and they're looking at rent uh, for that for an apartment there of 1200 euro for 75 square meters mm. which for me uh, it seems like a very high rent for me but um i don't i don't think that would be viable for me but uh it might be possible in the, f in the future once they can get construction costs down a bit more um mm. that your rent would be would be affordable so and then, but you're just, you're just paying that that kind of rent forever. Then, mm. um, I think. And what what 
the landlord is allowed to increase then is, is controlled as well. So um, you'd be looking at having a, an AHB, an approved housing body yeah. as, a, as a landlord typically. Mm -hmm. So they, they would be sort of uh, socially oriented kind of uh, landlord, I guess. So yeah, on the face of it, that, that should be a kind of an okay model. If, you, if you've got permanent, realistically, genuinely affordable uh, rent, then you can, you can save for the future. Mm. Uh, what bothers me a little bit, and I think it's related to the fact that, uh, you know, um, new graduates don't earn a great deal of money is that it seems to me that, you know, over the recent years, the architects put in this position of having to carry a sense of guilt or responsibility for the ills, a guilt for the way things are done and the way things are procured and housing is built. I feel that somehow, um, that's, uh, that's why I feel, I, I sort of push more toward the idea of, of broadening out the discussion so that everybody, this society, the group, the, whoever, everybody takes responsibility for what's for the, the moves that are to be okay. made uh, so that it's not just the architect for other all sorts of reasons but like one at least would be so that the architect can get back to like if we all agree that um, there's to be that there's there's to be a better system and well, then the architect can get back to what he or she is good at which is you know saying all right well I just I'll just do something absolutely amazing for you but I find that because because we're sort of, we, we live under this sort of shadow, this cloud of guilt, you know, you're responsible for everything that's wrong and everything that's not properly coordinated and uh, all the social ills and whatever, that um, even, even when you think you're sort of doing a half decent job, even when you think you're engaging with design, you're not really, you know, you're not really getting down to the nub of it, you know, and you're always sort of somehow at the political end. And uh, it's, it's far from ideal. You know, it's not the way to go. Alice, you look like you're about to say something. Yeah, she just disagrees like, with us completely. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, just from my own experience, like I'm only in fourth year, but uh, I definitely feel like I um, didn't, I couldn't access the opportunities I wanted uh, when I was maybe taking a year out and trying to work because the only jobs I could get were in like firms that but we're doing like the general stuff and I couldn't do what I wanted to do as an architect, you know, and I felt a lot of guilt working in these very uh, frivolous kind of, you know, on these very like uh, elitist kind of projects. I was in New York for a year and it was great experience, but it was nowhere where I, where I wanted to go. And uh, yeah, I was just going to share my experience of that as a graduate uh I'm doing the masters now, but um, it's definitely uh, and you find that you kind of just have to give up and go for whatever job you can get sometimes because the firms that you want to work for can't afford to take you on. Basically, uh, I don't know. That's just my experience uh, of it. Um, so I don't know uh, how because I think that people's opinions are like you know as a student you're very. Uh, ambitious and you can see that you want to make change but I so often find that I feel like as an architect I won't maybe be able to make that change uh, and that is very frustrating um, but I do think yeah it needs to become more political and I don't know how that can happen Mark maybe you could elaborate on your ambition this, what I love about what we are doing here um, having this is that this is part of being what Tom is doing what we're doing here now just talking is part of is part of this choice to be to be more political I just when you talked when you spoke Alice I spoke a couple of years ago to a pal uh, and we were she was working in Belfast where I was up there and she said oh she said yes I was in Berlin in 91 when all those people were getting to work on the uh, Jewish Museum. There was a bunch of people who kind of knew each other. She said, and she said, uh, oh, I wished I could have afforded to work on that project. And mm -hmm. I was kind of going, what do you mean? And it was like, she, she just didn't have enough. She just needed to be earning a lot more money because the, everyone knew the choice to work on that project was going to be, it's going to be a, a huge, a huge thing for everyone in their lives, but you couldn't afford to work on it unless you had some security. 
and kind of that's that says an awful lot to me about the way architecture is set up that if you if you want to get into practice at a very high level you have to be you have to have, have to have a lot of capital already i mean actual capital of some kind or other yeah mark a couple of years ago um i was looking for internships for some of our students in wit and uh one of the better known offices um but it's to me that you know if we were, if WIT was in a position to pay, they might take them on. Well, yeah, it's a real struggle, and the accommodation is just a yet another part of this this um, massive. I don't know how the how the young people are, can live in the city, even as students. It's just mind boggling because even since my days, I think I think though the like uh, the issues that. Um that Alice has just kind of outlined there kind of extend into practice a little bit as well though because um, you know you, you can't af you can't afford to to work for nothing or you can't afford to work on on low wages so like a lot of practice is kind of taking what comes um, you can't really control to 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 a large extent or most practices can't really control what they work on uh, it's mostly like a kind of continuation of what they've done before so uh, yeah, that means for, for, for a lot of practices that they, they just have to kind of do the best with, with what they have, you know, and that's, that's reality. It, it seems kind of unfair to me to, um, to expect people to uh, kind of do, do more than that. Or what, what, what do you think, Mark or Alice? Like to- Totally. What Gary is talking about with this guilt, you know, this guilt feeling. Um, it's people are in an impossible position if, 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 you know, if you can't earn enough to live on or, you know, and, and then this becomes conflated with moral questions about only doing the right kind of work, you know. Hey, listen, um, it's great to uh, start these conversations. Maybe, maybe in current, I don't know, Tom, I'm gonna to dump you in it now, but maybe not necessarily the book club, but maybe current, could, you could make a presentation at some point of, of your work um, to the to this on this platform, we have a few ideas uh, uh, kind of lined up. Where, like Jim Roach is going to do the Palestine architecture one, and uh, I was going to do one on crits and the, the work I'm doing with Patrick Flynn and so on. Maybe you might be able to do one, and so Alice and Steph, we could talk about it um, coming up. That would, yeah, great. that would be great if that's you too. Yeah, Tom, I'd love to see, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see a presentation and I'd, I'd love to see a discussion about crits too, uh, Mark. I mean, I didn't realize other people were out there thinking about this, um, but it's certainly something that I'm very, very interested in and this power trip imbalance thing that goes on that just, all it seems to do is just destroy young people's confidence. Mm. And, you know, it just, uh, I, I, I'm particularly interested because, um, like the thing about WIT, I know Adam's here with me. Well, he's not here with me, but he's here, I see. Uh, uh, I don't think it's unfair to say, and I don't think the students at WIT would mind me saying, that the thing that sort of sort that distinguishes maybe us a little bit from the other schools is that our students typically come from, un, from less privileged mm. backgrounds. I, mean, I think that's the difference, really, between WIT and the other schools. Mm. And um, it puts them in a completely different situation, you know, when they're when they're trying to, uh, you know, pay for their education, when they're, you know, they're, the the pressures are sometimes enormous. Mm -hmm. And because I came from the, the UCD school, the UCD background, I came from fairly, I have a parent and family who were middle class, we didn't have a whole lot of money, but we never had to worry. I mean, I, it was only when I actually started to lecture at WIT that I began to realize that there's a completely different aspect to all of this that I was just, totally unaware of and to my shame uh, and so I find now that uh, I, I do think that um, I find myself thinking a lot more from the point of view of our WIT students and what it is that we need to do to get them onto a level playing field mm. so that they can make a decent living and have a family and just get through life uh, you know it's it's really quite a it's really quite an enormous, it's, it's a really enormous thing. We, I mean, middle-class people take it for granted, but once you realize that it's not the same for everybody, you realize that it's, uh, you have to, there's some, something, you know, you really, you 
have to get you have to roll up your sleeves and do something about this. Yeah, you know, it's an obligation. Very good. I mean, um, class class structure and and our profession, I believe, is a key key element. Yeah. Um, the other thing is in the world to enable neoliberalism is immiserating. That was a line in the article we read is immiserating or uh, you could even say proletarianizing large sections of the former middle classes. This is a phenomenon in the United States now, wi widely, dis widely discussed. The homelessness you see in Los Angeles, San Francisco, these places is, is uh, the collapse to a large extent of the middle classes um, mm. in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, and architects face this proletarianization um, so yeah, we we can we can begin by doing work by talking like this, and we can begin by trying to form things like this, the union of architects and, and groups like Tom's group and people campaigning, um, and and examining what we do ourselves. It doesn't help the poor, unfortunate graduates who's still got to go out and somehow or other try to cobble together a, a living out of all of this. Um, but we can't address those problems. We can at least uh, shine light onto the problems and have conversations about them.